Uh, okay, so we are going to be possibly, yes, okay, we're going to be uh, looking at church discipline. Um, it's one of those things that um, you don't really think you need to know about until you do need to know about it. <laughs> and uh, we all have our own kind of ideas of, you know, what do we do when somebody causes a problem with the church? What do you do when, you know, there's just some things going on in a church? I mean, what's that? So... Just a few, a few questions we're going to look at. What do you do when someone does something you don't think they should? What do you do when you see someone in sin? What do you do when someone leaves or is asked to leave the church? How do you treat ex-Christians or ex-church members, either or? So it's kind of a lot of questions there, and, and I hope to look at all of them. Um, and I, I want to kind of make sure that if you have any questions, please, you know, do ask if I'm, if I forget anything. But first off, we'll start with Matthew 18. And this is just a, a very valuable but very short passage on um, how to deal with church conflict most uh, broadly, I should say. So in chapter 18, starting in verse 15, it says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And we'll stop there. I don't want to go to the next part quite yet. Um, so th the first step is in regards to what you would call unintentional or private sin. Something that maybe uh, someone was, wasn't aware that they did. You know, like, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't know that that was something that was... You know, whatever. Or maybe they just uh, came out of a certain lifestyle and they were unaware that what they had been doing before they were saved um, was a sin. So this is like the first step. So the, what, we, what you do in that situation is you go to them. You go to the person and say, look, I, I know that you've been doing this and, you know, this is what the scriptures say. So once again, this requires a little bit of humility on our part. First off, if we're the person going to the person, it's very important that you don't do it like you're better than them. You want to make sure that your attitude is right, and, you know, you don't want to be hopping down everybody's throat, and you also don't want to be lording it over them. You, you want to make sure that you say what needs to be said, but in, in a nice way, you know what I mean? And, but then also, if you're the person who somebody is correcting, make sure that you have a... Not every time that somebody says something to you, are they going to be right. But you need to have a humble spirit that if somebody says something, you'll genuinely think about it and pray about it and look at the scriptures for yourself to see if there's some basis there. Because the last thing you want is to be someone who's, you know, just so set in their ways and bitter that you can't be told what to do. You know, you always have a problem with anybody, everybody. I mean, that's the last thing you want. So what happens if you go and talk to them? Well, hold on. Let me first give some examples. Like, okay. Um... Um, you caught them on pornography, maybe they're like, oh, well, pornography is wrong, and it's like, well, you know, then you would show them, okay, yes, it is wrong because of this. Um, another example would be um, addiction to opioids, which is actually a very common thing. But in all of these things, it's very important that baby Christians should not be um, weighted down with rules. When you're a baby, you treat them like a baby. As they grow, see what I mean, there, there's, there's different stages. You wouldn't go to... You wouldn't go to my four-year-old son and tell him that he needs to go get a job and wash his laundry. I mean, you wouldn't tell him that stuff because, I mean, he's four years old. <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing when you're dealing with Christians. When you're dealing with a baby Christian, I mean, you kind of have to really give them grace and work with them. And, and you know, it's, it's something that, that you don't just throw a bunch of rules at them. I, I hope you get what I'm saying here. So, okay, what happens if you go and talk to them and they, they don't listen? They're like, no, I'm just, no. Well, so then it, you treat it in regards to a public sin or an intentional sin. Basically, you have told them, you have warned them, they know that what they're doing is wrong, they just choose not to listen to you. Well, then the next step would be that you take uh, two witnesses. Now, I want to kind of real quickly point this out here. For someone who is not yet um, fully involved in the church, you know what I mean? Like maybe isn't really a member yet, um, you know what I mean? Someone who's just kind of... They have been going. Once again, that takes us back to the whole giving them grace thing. 
But if someone is, you know, involved in the church, they're a member, they're, you know, they've been there for a while, there, there, is, there has been growth, um, then you would go to this next step, and this is where you take two witnesses and talk to them about it. Um, now, you'll notice that at this point, it should be pretty obvious whether it's an actual sin or whether it's just a thing of personal preference. Like, for instance, here's some good examples of personal preference. Well, you uh, wore your hair like this, and I think that that was not good. Well, that's not really a sin. Um, well, you know, uh, women shouldn't wear pants in church. Uh, well, see what I mean? That's not really a thing. So that's more of a personal preference. See what I mean? Yeah. Then you can compare that with, like, an actual sin, and, you know, then it kind of starts to come together. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is actually a sin. So I guess that would be... Something important to remember, don't, don't treat your personal preferences as though it's an issue of morality, when it's not. Um, when I was a kid, the big hot topic was getting in fights with people about the music style that they listen to. So if it had too much drums or too much guitar, it was sinful. Even though it really wasn't, see what I mean? It was just an issue of personal preference. Uh, a lot of people around here like listening to the more like rap and hip hop and stuff. I'm not a big fan of that stuff, but it's not a sin for somebody to listen to it. See what I mean? Um, I hope you kind of see the difference there. Um, so then, if, if they still, you know, you, you've talked to them about it as a friend, they haven't listened, so you've taken witnesses, and they still haven't listened, then it would go to the next step, which is where the church leadership gets involved. Now, oftentimes what people do is they just hop straight to the step. They have a personal grievance with, with a brother. And instead of talking about it, they decide to gossip about it. If you've been in church longer than six months, you probably have seen this happen. I mean, not necessarily here, but I mean, it happens. Um, <laughs> or, you know, maybe you, you just got your feelings hurt about something, so you instantly go to the pastor and tattle on the other person. You know, right? Because it's easier to just tell somebody else than to just deal with it yourself. And uh, the problem with that is... First off, you weight the pastor down with a bunch of nonsense he shouldn't have to deal with. But the, even bigger than that is that you literally keep yourself from growing as a Christian, and you prevent yourself from having a healthy relationship with that person. You know what I mean? So, don't gossip and don't badmouth that. Whoever wrote this slide was a genius. That's exactly what I just said. <laughs> it's really, really important, though, because, once again, in all the church conflicts that I've ever been in, Usually gossip plays a major role. And gossip is one of the biggest things that tears churches apart. I mean, it's just, it's not good. <laughs> Basically, it's, it goes back to a very simple rule. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. It's a very good rule of thumb. Even if somebody's been talking about you behind your back, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. It, it's okay to not have anything to say. It's all right. Um, in fact, most of the time, that's probably for the best. Don't escalate it if it doesn't need to be escalated. Um, I'm not really going to elaborate on that one. I think that one just kind of explains itself. And once again, separate sin from personal preference. So, any questions before we move on? No? Okay. So, we really want to make sure that, that um, I'm being clear on a few of these things before we go to the next thing. Um, so, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to use some examples here. Let's say Krista comes to me and says, hey, Joe over there, I, I, I saw him doing do, 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 do. What should I say to Krista? Is that <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> that's a real good start, Dan. <laughs> what does that have to do with me? Though? Yeah, that's what she said. <laughs> that's a real good start. Have you approached Joe about it? Have you asked him? Yes. Yes, a very good. I, 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 yes. So maybe, maybe a good combination of both those things. Okay, first off, this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> and then second off, have you talked to them about it? That's the very, very, yes, exactly. Remember that gossip is very, very, very easy to spread. It's kind of like a zombie outbreak. <laughs> and it's just as infectious, too. It makes you brainless, and uh, it's just bad. And then before you know it, you're, you're on one of two opposing camps. You know, and just it, gossip has this just this power to it to destroy families and destroy churches, and it, it's not good. Gossip is one of those things that's just, it's, it's never good. It's never where you can walk away from it and be like, 
Yeah, I gossiped too, but I won. If you gossip, you didn't win. Like, you, you didn't win if you gossiped. Okay, so then just a few, a few next, uh, I guess you could say last steps after those initial three stages. You know, you go to them as a friend, then you go to them with witnesses, and then you, you take it to the church leadership. So then that takes us to the last uh, steps here. First off, um, if someone refuses to turn from their sin uh, after the church leadership uh, talks to them, then they are removed from fellowship. Now, this is not the same as being excommunicated. Excommunicated means that you are banned from the church for life. You can never come back. Um, your family can't talk to you. The church can't. It's just a whole big messy thing. Removing them from fellowship is, is different. It says, okay, you are welcome to come back when you go through the pastor's office. In other words, you have made problems. And if, you're, if you decide to ever come back, you need to go through the pastor's office first. Talk to him. Before you can come back into, you know, there's some people that we don't just let walk into the door because they've caused problems. So if they want to come back, they, they have to go talk to the pastor. See what I mean? Because they've they've caused they've caused a problem. You, you kind of get what I'm saying? And um, so removing them from fellowship. The First Corinthians chapter five. And one thing that people say is, oh, that, that seems kind of cruel and heartless. Well. Remember that we do as Christ told us to do, which was God himself, and he passed it on to his disciples. And Paul talked about this too. We aren't doing something that's made up. We're doing something that God decided on. And he decided that it was more destructive to have um, a rebellious person in the body than it was to have them pushed out of the body. If God decided that... Then maybe we need to be humble and realize that some people need to work out their nonsense before they come and disturb the whole church. Probably a good thing to remember. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses uh, 2 through 13. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. Now, be careful of jerking verses out of context. What some people say is you can't judge me. Well, in the body, actually, we are meant to judge each other. And this is exactly what Paul just said. I have already judged them, and you need to judge them too. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. So basically, when there's a little bit of sin, it spreads. Just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world, or with the covetous and swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. There's a bunch of sinners out there. You, 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 you can't get away from them. I mean, it's the... <laughs> obviously, I didn't mean that. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a brother, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked from among yourselves. Now, I've seen a drastic switch on its head in my short lifetime. What I have seen is I've seen Christians decide to get a gossip and, back, and, and badmouth people and not judge each other for that. Then I've seen them go out into the world and try to judge everybody, judge the sinners for being sinners. Well, surprise, surprise, sinners are sinners. Like, why does this surprise you? You don't have to go out there and tell them that their sinners are going to hell. I mean, goodness sakes, calm down with that. But what we are told to do is judge the judges in the body. There is a serious problem when Christians are allowed to just sit there gossiping among themselves, and nobody says anything. That's a serious problem. I mean, that is a serious problem. You genuinely have to consider, am I really a Christian, if you're okay with sitting there talking bad about people? I mean, there just, come, there just comes a point when you say, this is specifically commanded, God told us not to do this. 
To do it is to sin. And you have to cross that point of saying, I'm not going to get involved with this stuff. And regardless of whatever you've done in the past, if you realize that you're doing it, stop it. Just, just stop it. It, it destroys, destroys people. Titus 3, uh, 10 through 11, which uh, Paul was writing to a, to a young pastor, I don't flip past here, whose name was, believe it or not, Titus. In chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, he says this. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. See, there's nothing he can do about it because he's not willing to, to change. See what I mean? So that there comes a point when you have to say, okay, well, when you're ready to change, we'll have this conversation. But you can't let people who, are, who call themselves Christians disrupt the whole body because they're not willing to change. So, I mean, you don't want the many to be led astray because of the one person's stubbornness. It's hard, and you should never do it whim whimsically. I was reading this book called Game of Thrones, which is a terrible book. I mean, goodness sakes, it was a terrible book. But in it, the king says this. He says, do you, he's talking to his son. He says, do you know why I killed that man? He was, it was, a, it was a, a, you know, where the king kills somebody? What's that called? A... Um, Execution, yes. Who's ever said this? Whoever said that? Yes, execution. It was an execution. He says, do you know why I did that? And the son says, yeah, because he did this, this, and this. And the king says, no, no, no. That's not, that's not what my point was. Do you know why I executed him instead of having someone else execute him? And he said, no. He said, because a king shouldn't forget that it's a life that you're taking. See what I mean? When, 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 when it comes down to church discipline, it's not... Thank God we, get, we got rid of that pain in the butt person. It should never be like that. And if it is like that, that's a testament as to how wrong your attitude is. But sometimes you have to sacrifice the one for the sake of the many. Does that kind of make sense? If you're a fan of Star Trek, maybe it makes a little bit more sense. <laughs> the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the new. <laughs> I'm a big Star Trek fan. Don't, don't judge me. Um, so then, when this process is carried through, be ready to forgive. Now, with, with discretion. With discretion. Because did you know that there are some people who just try to get people on their side? They have no intention of fixing the problem. They just want people to get on their side. Did you know that? There are some people who don't care about the church. They just want to win an argument. They exist. Do not be naive on this. So don't be surprised when somebody who was a problem in the past comes back and, oh, thank God you came back. Well, maybe if you've changed your attitude problem. If you haven't changed your attitude, then no thank God that you're back. You need to go again. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> there, there, there's a point when you don't drool over someone who's a problem person. There, there's a point when if someone's a problem person, I, oh, yeah, it's fine. Let them destroy all these people. <laughs> Because I'm just so glad to have them back. That's not love. That's stupidity. That's stupidity. You don't sacrifice many for, for one disruptive person, just like he said in Titus. But with that being said, do be ready to forgive. 2 Corinthians says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And remember that when you're dealing with church discipline, you discipline differently at different people's ages. Remember that. I'm not just talking about physical, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about spiritual. You know what I mean? When somebody is just dipping their feet in the church, they're not going to have their act together. And you need to be okay with that. But when somebody's been in a church for 50 years and they're still gossiping, that's not okay. That, that's not okay. Like, there comes a point where you say, hey, we're, we're, we're done with that. You've been here for 50 years, it's time that you grew up. You don't want 50-year-olds sitting in a toddler high chair. That's just, I mean, Pastor was talking about this a couple Sundays ago. That's not healthy for anyone. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says this. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. So on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Verse 8, wherever I urge, wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. So once somebody does turn from their sin and they do take that step, you know, it, it is important that you do welcome them back in. 
But be careful of people who play the victim. Oh, well, that church wronged me, and do, do, do. it's like, okay, that's a nice story, and I'm glad they had a time to weave such a, such a fantastic story. They should definitely sell it to Hollywood. But in the meantime, do you know people do lie? People do still lie. It is something that they do. And when you hear, hear a story that's just perfect and somebody's 100% the victim, just be a little bit cautious. Just, just be a little bit cautious about that because people do still lie about stuff. So, um, once again, with caution, I already explained that. Don't associate with people who have been a problem person in a church. Don't associate with them because what, what happens is their nasty little attitude spreads to you. And then you start defending them. Well, they weren't wrong. And then, now all of a sudden, you are against the leadership of the church. And now we have a church split. All because you took somebody's story for granted that you have no idea if it's true or not. You simply believed them because you either wanted to believe them or maybe they were your friend. So you're in the middle of a conflict that you have no idea what you're talking about. Does that seem like a good idea? Let's just stop and think about this for a second. No, that doesn't seem like a good idea. And uh, so 2 Thessalonians, uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 14. Oh, I'm in 1 Thessalonians. I was like, it's not there. It disappeared. Okay, here it is. Uh, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. To try and be loving by giving undeserved trust or mercy or refusing to follow through is to disobey God. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm being loving. No, you're disobeying God. See, when God tells you something, he means it. He's not one of those parents who says something and, oh, okay, whatever, you just make your own rules. No, he told us something, and then he expects for us to do that thing. See what I mean? So if he told us this is how you handle this, then when you say, no, I'm not going to handle that, I'm friends with this person. I would rather listen to their stories of gossip. Well, so you're disobeying God, and you're kind of stupid because you're setting yourself up for failure spiritually. That's just a bad idea. See, I kind of have this idea that we should have kind of the mindset of, I want to grow. I mean, that just seems like a good mindset to have. And when you do things like get involved in gossip and backbiting and all that nonsense, you are literally saying, I do not want to grow. Because it is impossible to grow while you're gossiping. It's impossible. I mean, you will literally spend 15 years of your life doing the exact same thing and not seeing any more of God than you were at the beginning of the 15 years. Because God's not a real big fan of gossip. It's not one of his favorite things. In fact, Proverbs says it's one of the things that he hates. Proverbs says that there's seven things that God hates. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's on there. The whole lying tongue thing, man. And he, it's really up on his hate list. So, anyways. Um, so to try and be loving by giving undeserved trust. Well, what do I mean? Well, Pastor talked about this. I think it was on a Wednesday night. I'm not, don't quote me on that. But um, about how when Joseph's brothers came back, he had a test for them to see if they'd actually changed. Now, reading the story, we have no idea if Joseph is bitter or if he's not bitter, we have no idea. Genesis doesn't tell us like what was going on in his heart, what was going on in his head. It doesn't say that. It just says that he tested them. So we're left with a bunch of questions, and we're like, is he going to kill off all of his brothers? Like, holy crap, this story got dark. And then it resolves itself, and you're like, oh, oh okay. That's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. But my point being, don't give undeserved trust. And another good example of undeserved trust is somebody gets out of a church conflict. They don't go to the church anymore. Details are sketchy. You don't know any of the details. So then you start talking to them, and they tell you this fantastic story, and you just believe it. That would be undeserved trust. What are the chances that all the leaders of the church really got together and connived and, you know, really did do this? Like, I mean, come on. Really? And furthermore, why should you believe this one person who was kicked out of fellowship instead of listening to the whole of the body that's still there. <coughs> and that just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that would be undeserved trust, or undeserved mercy, where, oh, it's okay, I forgive them. Well, they're not sorry yet. There can be no forgiveness where there's no repentance. You can't forgive what hasn't been repented. When people die, do they go to hell? Yes, if they don't believe in Jesus, why? Because there was no repentance. Where there's no repentance, there can be no forgiveness. God wouldn't ask us to do something that he himself does not do. However, this takes us to a whole other thing. It's important that in all this, 
you do not make yourself into God, and you do not make yourself into the judge. Okay? The church leadership is required to judge those, but that doesn't mean that we are held with, um, without judgment ourselves. In fact, we'll be judged all the harsher. And if we do something, we'll, God will judge us harsher than the person that we judged unfairly. See what I mean? So God does set up a certain, or a certain level of order. So then a, a few last things about guarding your heart here. Now, first off, Colossians 3, 12 through 14. This is the only part in the New Testament where it, where it tells Christians what to wear. It says, clothe yourselves in patience and love and kindness. Always act with these things. And you can read it. In fact, I'll, I'll read it. Why not? Colossians 3, 12 through 14. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on, is how the NASB says it. If you have an NIV, it probably says clothe yourself. Um, but put on is, is, is what he's saying there is put on like clothing. Um, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Because what happens is when there comes a, a, an issue of gossip, it really stirs up things in our heart. Sometimes things that were hidden and they were there all along, sometimes it puts something in our heart that wasn't there. And that's why Hebrews talks about, be careful, lest you get entangled in the same sin that this other person is. And just you know, watch out for that. So anyways... Romans 12, 14, another part that talks about it. Romans, now, let's be absolutely clear here. Gossip is stupid. You destroy someone else's reputation. That's stupid. Gossip is stupid. So don't, don't, ha don't, don't sugarcoat it. It really is stupid. And if you have been involved with gossip, don't. You give yourself a terrible bad name, and people start to know you as a gossip. And they start to, the only people that you're going to have as friends are people who are like you. Because the people who don't gossip, they're not going to want to hang around you. So then you're going to have a bunch of shallow friendships, and you're going to wonder, how come I don't have any good friends? And it's because you're not a good friend. You can always trust a gossip to gossip. Romans 12, 14 says this. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So let's say someone is, is, is gossiping about you. What should you do? Bless and do not curse. Now we'll go down to uh, verse uh, 17 through 19. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect, respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now don't do this. Don't do a little bit like to try it and just so you can get, let, let yourself get off with it like, oh... Well, you know, I, I tried, and I, I'm a good person. They're, they're the wrong ones. And then, you see what I mean? Like, it says, as much as it depends on you. What I see a lot of people doing is, well, you know, I, I, I tried to not gossip. I tried to be the bigger person, but they were doing it. So I, I, you know, whatever, just give it back to them, too. See what I mean? There has to be a point where you say, eh, that's not who I am. Uh, anyways, uh, verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Blood I just can't let this go. You know what we do when we pray for something? We say, oh, I prayed for that once. And then God didn't answer that after that one time. I tried tithing. It didn't work. <laughs> what? <laughs> you mean it doesn't work? You, you give God your money. I mean, how does that not work? You see what I mean? And it's the exact same thing with, with trying to be at peace with, some, with people. Sometimes we, you know, we're, 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 we're sometimes real hard with people who maybe just slipped once or twice. And uh, now I'm not talking about problem people. I'm talking about when, when somebody just does something that just personally offends you. And instead of just trying to make peace in the situation. Because if you do go to church, you are going to get your feelings hurt. Because we're a bunch of people here who all make mistakes. Right? And when you're a bunch of, around a bunch of people who make mistakes, and you make mistakes because you're a person too, I mean, you're going to have to give grace. So be, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Let God do his things. You, you, know, you don't have to remind God to be just. God is just all by himself. You don't have to remind God to bring punishment to the wicked. He'll do that all by himself. 
He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need you to report on people who do wrong. He sees everything. He's got it covered. Really, he does. What he does tell you to do is to bless those who curse you and, and do not curse. He says, when somebody does it wrong to you, you keep doing right. You know what I mean? So, keep all those things in mind. Never take your own revenge. Oh, the things that could be said. So their stupidity doesn't mean you should act stupid. That's just a general rule in life. You're going to find that one kind of repeats itself. You're going to be married, for instance, and your spouse will do something real stupid. And you could either gloat over them, you could store it in that memory bank, memory bank to bring it back up in a later, later conversation. Remember that time that you did? Or you could just let it go. Which is probably the better solution. Just throwing that out there. Matthew 5.44 Matthew 5.44 It says this, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Boy, that's easier said than done. Oh, I just love this person who keeps talking behind my back and keeps stirring up a bunch of bullcrap. Boy, I love that. Oh, I love them. I love them so much. Just, oh, I just wish I could give them a bear hug and show them how much I love them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not real easy to do that. That's going to be something easier said than done. But uh, remember what Jesus did when, you know, when he was on the cross, you know, dying for everybody's sin. Father, forgive them. Remember that, you know, so... I don't think that you have worse than God dying on a cross, just throwing it out there. Um, so live above reproach and do not let their evil spread to you. It's like gangrene. Don't let it get in. Don't let it get in. you, you got to watch out. Be on guard and watch your heart. Watch your heart. Have you guys ever seen the cartoon uh, Frozen? Boy, once that, fro once it, once that ice gets in there, it's, it's hard to heal the heart. If it was just a head wound, man, that's easy to fix. When it's a heart wound, that, that's hard to fix. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Live above reproach. What that means is it doesn't mean don't ever sin. It means live in such a way where you're, a, you're just... Like, you don't have to worry, did Michael really gossip about me? Because let me just fill you in here. I didn't. I don't talk about you. I would appreciate it if you don't talk to me, about me either. You know? But I don't talk about you. I don't go behind your guys' backs and say, hey, you should have seen what Renee did, you know. Because I probably did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say, I need to tell you guys about what Renee just did. Uh, we got to talk to her, get that woman calmed down. Oh, Buckle her down, man. No, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> they will lie about you, and to you it will be hard. Which brings me to our last little slide here. Bam! Don't be surprised. Ex-Christians and fake Christians have, number one, used money to try and bribe slash buy the leaders of the church. This surprises people. First off, let me just kind of clarify. Did you know that the money that comes into this church doesn't go into our pockets? Did you know that? That surprises people. Furthermore, did you know that us as pastors, we pay tithes too? Did you know that? In fact, if we don't, our denomination would get us in trouble. Think of it as a spanking. <laughs> they would get us in trouble. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then remember this. Many of the people who work in churches have talents to do something that they would make more money on. If you want to make money, pastoring is really not the best area to go into. There's a lot of very well-paying jobs. So let me just kind of clarify. You can't buy us. <laughs> if you think you can, you're wrong. I mean, literally... We if we wanted more money, we could go out and get another job. Don't worry about that. But let me just kind of clarify this. People have tried to do that here at this church and at other churches. People have tried to bribe us and buy us out. Well, if you don't cave, you know, you might lose my financial support. Yeah, people do do that. Joke's on them because I wouldn't know what to do with money anyways if I had it. I don't know, what's this green stuff? What do what I do with it? I mean, do I hang it on the wall? Do I make it out? What do I do? Uh, I'm so used to being poor that at this point, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do with money. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Um, but anyways, um, so, so this, this is something that, that's typical. 
of those kinds of people, I don't want you to be surprised because you're not going to hear this in their little stories that they tell you. People who have a gripe with God or with a pastor, they'll lie to you. And I want, the reason why I'm telling you, you might say, why are you telling me this? Because I've seen this happen too much. Somebody will get, will do something to, to, to basically to destroy the church on purpose. The pastor will, 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 will take action and, and resolve the conflict. And then they'll go and spread a bunch of false news that then makes its way around the whole community. We had, we had quite the debacle a couple weeks ago with Facebook that wasn't even based on reality. And uh, we have paperwork to verify what we did. And it's like, people do lie. People do lie. Don't, don't just believe things that people tell you. But they don't lie on Facebook. Do they? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Everything you see on Facebook is true. Oh, Everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually how I find out if some people have broken up or not. I just look on Facebook because it's like, if I ask you, you're going to lie to me. If I look on Facebook, man, then I'll know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ex-Christians and fake Christians have spread lies about how pastor and others have acted. There is some, I'm actually kind of appalled, and I feel, that, feel it kind of my duty to, 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 to do it, address this. When somebody tells you the pastor does something that sounds just like something wicked, something that a righteous person wouldn't do, maybe don't believe it. And if it's just something that gets rooted in your head and you just can't get it out, go talk to him. Because I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that it's not. Not true. It's just not true. I mean, honestly, you can't just take something that somebody says, and, oh yeah, yeah, that, they definitely did that. That church over there, they're just in it for the money. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, or that sometimes they'll invent what was said. Don't believe everything you hear and stay out of gossip. I mean, this is just... Now, why I mention this, you know that Tula Rosa is not that big. It's like got 3,000-something people. I mean, it's a tiny little place. Chances are, if somebody starts spreading gossip, you're going to hear it. What's important is that you don't believe everything that somebody says. And where necessary, do correct the person spreading the nonsense. Oh, well, this is, this is what that church did. Uh, no, that's not what that church did. I know them. Like, that's just, no. Um, they have manipulated, they have attempted to get people to follow them. That's called a church split. It doesn't, see, a church split isn't where, two, where one church separates into two equal bodies and everybody's happy. That's not a church split. That, well, I guess it is a church split. But that's not what a church split typically looks like. What a church split usually looks like is one person can't keep their mouth shut. And so they just go around causing problems. And then they try and manipulate people into following them by telling them only the parts that they want them to hear just so that they'll get on their side. And then once they form their little army... Then they, oh, well, we're just going to set things straight. And then they usually branch off and make a house church. That's typically what they do. It's kind of the same thing over and over again that you see. But uh, once again, joke's on them because we're not, we're not leaving. <laughs> you can't get rid of us that easy. Um, okay. They do act with malice. They do get into immoral relationships. They do teach wrong doctrine. This is something that, that they do, and you can't be surprised. You would be surprised how many conversations I've had over the past couple months where somebody said, well, pastor did this. And I said, no, no, that didn't happen. And they say, well, this person said that that's what happened. Well, they lied. Like, <laughs> why do you suddenly believe pastor who's been here for eight years, not uh, just fixing things? Why would he suddenly do, do, do these things all of a sudden? So with that being said, just be careful, because this is, this is inevitably what happens. I will never fall. I can't be manipulated. I always just know. I, I, can, I can sense when people are lying. Okay. Sure you can. So then they get themselves into a compromising position where they start listening to somebody who's pissed off about something. And then they have, then they have a problem. See what I mean? So don't be surprised when these things happen. They will happen again in the future. They have happened in the past. We've survived. We will survive in the future. I'm not saying this. For my sake, I'm saying this for your sake. Because people will come to you with gossip and all kinds of nonsense. It's up to you whether you want to believe it or not. But I can guarantee you, gossip always sounds better when it's coming from just one side over there over the mountains. You know what I mean? So, just remember that. Um, any questions about, uh, about church discipline, what that looks like, what your responsibility is, all that kind of stuff? Just real quick summary. Don't listen to gossip. Be a peacemaker. And stay humble.
I mean, that's a good summary of everything we've talked about. Yeah, so, the devil's crafty. Yeah, he right, is. That's, that's you know, what this is all about right People here. forget that. You know, it, the Bible says that Satan, he's just prowling around like a lion waiting to, for who he can devour. And then people are surprised when things don't go right and when Satan attacks them. They're just surprised. It's like, well, God told you this was going to happen. So anyways, we're going to go ahead and stop it there. Um, can I get... Kirkman, would you mind closing us in prayer? Father God, we just thank you for this day. We just thank you for this study, Lord. We thank you that, that you've opened our hearts. We just pray that, that we just pray that everyone will understand the word we've gotten tonight, Lord, and that we'll be able to apply it. And we'll be able to live in, in harmony and unity, working together as a body, Lord. And we just pray that uh, you'll keep evil away from us.